and also a uh, fraction of active proteins everywhere should be small. So those are proteins telling the cell to go in the phase. So you should be here. Uh, and of course, it's easy to design uh, reactions which are like here, but you have to squeeze them into working range. So how the cell does it? So uh, this uh, in this paper, three mechanisms are uh, examined. So let's uh, go over them uh, one by one. Each of them does very simple reaction diffusion uh, model. So first, the simplest mechanism. You have this molecule C, right? So C is activated molecule, which tells the cell to go in down phase. C star is deactivated molecule. So when this molecule bumps into the center, into this uh, kinetic core, it, get, it gets immediately uh, deactivated, then floats away, but then it reactivates with rate alpha. Okay, as simple as that. <coughs> Bump into kinetic core, deactivate, float away, get activated, and so on. So uh, they examined this mechanism and found that under no circumstances, whatever parameters, uh, and of course there are some restraints, physical restraints on parameters. So normally, actually, the typical protein uh, diffuses uh, with the rate about 10 microns square per second, you can go far from that. And uh, the activated molecule becomes activated about one per second, you can't uh, maintain it for much longer than a second. So with realistic parameters, you can't uh, satisfy both requirements. Why? Very easy. Let's say, uh, so diffusion coefficient, there's just no way it can change. You can fiddle around a little bit with uh, the rate of activation. Let's, let's say you make the rate of activation uh, fast. Then, when the last kinetic core gets attached, you can activate all, all the molecules very fast. But uh, the molecules activating fast uh, will be deactivated only very close to kinetic core. So kinetic cores far from it wouldn't even feel this stop signal. Okay? Not going to work. If you make this rate very slow, that's great. <coughs> then you can. De deactivate huge area around the attached chromosome, but then you have to wait very long before you go into an phase. So this simplicity doesn't work. So they, they started thinking, well, uh, what should we add? How, how can we go around it? One of the uh, very elegant ideas was this. Uh, it's called self-propagating inhibition. So at the center, the same thing happens. Uh, activated molecule gets deactivated, then gets activated somewhere else. But also, when two of the molecules in the cytoplasm bump into each other, one of them deactivated, another activated, then both become deactivated. See? So, two same species, one activated, one deactivated, boom, both deactivated. This was great in terms of, uh, you can now maintain really tight uh, deactivation all over the nucleus. Why? Because you deactivate molecule here, right? It goes really fast, really far, and then deactivates everybody everywhere. So you kind of you spread your kinetic core effectively across the whole cell. Here's the big problem, though. When you switch off uh, the deactivation signal, the cell st stays deactivated forever. The reason is, this is very strong nonlinearity called autocatalytic reaction. If the molecule deactivates itself effectively. Right? So what happens, the molecules everywhere now start deactivating each other. They don't need kinetic core anymore. Okay, you you uh, created uh, effective unattached kinetic core diffused everywhere. You never will get out of this lock. So this, this just doesn't work at all. And finally, they stumbled onto a real mechanism which works. And this real mechanism is this. At the center, you have to deactivate one molecule, E. Then this molecule diffuses and deactivate another molecule, C. Okay? So now you need two molecules instead of one. Why is it better? Because uh, you have now a diffusing molecule uh, which spreads the signal from the kinetic world, right? So you maintain tight deactivation everywhere. But at the same time, uh, there's no autocatalytic reaction anymore. E is different molecule from C. So uh, there's no uh, nonlinear positive feedback and no lock into one state. So when you remove a uh, signal from the kinetic core, the system fast goes into uh, complete activation. Okay. So uh, all this is have waiting <laughs> arguments. Uh, if you're really interested in it, you just actually have to solve those equations, which are 
partial differential equations, but still simple enough to be solved in a traditional software. You don't have to know how to do that. And uh, really read this paper because there are lots of beautiful uh, theoretical physics arguments in there. It just sort of, it's uh, one of these golden standard papers in my view. Uh, also, there was a follow-up paper uh, which just added just tiny little twist to uh, um, John uh work. And this twist was, um, so uh, this successful mechanism which I just described, um, it uh, doesn't amplify the signal from the kinetic core. So basically, it's a linear system. One molecule gets deactivated with the kinetic core, deactivates another molecule. So it's sort of one signal, one molecule, one molecule. Now, uh, this guy's, it's not as, as great a paper, but it's an interesting twist. This guy's add, added just a little twist. Uh, instead of this reaction of Don Chichito, they, they are suggesting something more complicated. Uh, when deactivated and activated uh, E uh, bump together, it creates uh, deactivated E and activated C, and then C gets deactivated. So the point here, it's, uh, there's no autocatalytic auto reaction here, but, there's, but the um, signal gets amplified. Uh, and the amplification is basically here. So one deactivated, one activated molecule, one deactivated, and now you have two deactivated molecules. So it's, the, the signal is getting actually stronger. Okay? It, it works better. And again, uh, this is an example. You don't, they don't know anything about real reactions going on the cell. But they have very uh, beautiful physical arguments and they're asking the right questions and uh, giving something to biologists uh, to think about. So uh, now actually it's a um, very exciting time for this field, I would say, for my project uh, pathway because uh, biologists like this stuff. Uh, but only so much because they also have all this concern with actual proteins. So now you have on the one hand this uh, paper with actual reactions and actual proteins. Uh, but it, I wouldn't say it tells anybody anything new. At the same time, there's this beautiful physical papers. Uh, those cases don't know much about actual mitotic checkpoint, but they have very interesting qualitative ideas. Now there's, uh, it's time for somebody to, to do some real damage. Um, so uh, let me just mention uh, another uh, recent paper of the same uh, group of Nama Parkai. Uh, it's uh, actually, Daniel, I think, was giving this uh, beautiful talks about uh, noise in uh, some biological systems. So I'm not going to talk about noise and mitosis, but it's a huge and extremely important topic. So I, I'll just mention very briefly uh, what, what noise means here. So uh, we started today with uh, this um, uh, interactome and this system of chemical reactions, right? And they were described with deterministic ordinary differential equations, which is fine in uh, sort of in uh, in vitro biochemistry, but in the cell, the actual numbers of some of the molecules participating is amazingly small. For example, in this. Um, uh, in this uh, system of reactions uh, shown, uh, shown here, right? Uh, the number of copies of each molecule is like thousands. Uh, but for example, CDC, this is the most scarce uh, molecule. It's just a few hundreds of them. Okay. So uh, it's really not, not a great approximation to use ODE, ODE is for, for this reaction. So you have to actually uh, use stochastic methods to simulate the reaction. And you can imagine that there would be a tremendous amount of noise in this system. And uh, noise, of course, is bad because noise means uh, error in my public chip way. So um, this uh, paper then uh, discusses what happens uh, when you uh, actually start simulating stochastically uh, reaction involving uh, production of uh, CDC. So a cell constantly produces CDC molecule CDC20 and constantly degrades it. And the simplest idea, you know, it just produces this molecule, this molecule is degraded and it participates in certain reaction. And when they examined uh, this reaction with realistic parameters, it uh, turns out that uh, the characteristic uh, noise uh, of the translation process will uh, 
create expected uh, huge noise in uh, actual uh, rate of reaction of uh, inhibiting uh, anaphase promoting complex. So they asked how can the cell uh, go around it? And uh, the simple idea is to add one more reaction which is called uh, sequestering. So basically before a uh, CDC molecule does something, it has to go into certain complex and then it's, uh, this complex either degraded or transformed into a uh, working CDC molecule. So they basically added a couple of reactions. So you see that the three equations describing simple reactions and since that four is describing more complicated reactions. And they found that in this more uh, complicated system, uh, the noise is completely suppressed. Um, it's uh, not easy to explain the hand-waving arguments was the qualitative idea behind suppressing the noise, but crudely it's like that. So it, it works like a uh, filter. Those of you who studied electrical engineering uh, should know that. So basically you have input in some, some black box and all black box introduces some delays. So if you put some noise in the system with delays, you kind of integrate your signal over some period of time. And the integration always uh, get, get rid, gets rid of some noise, as simple as that. Okay, so there's nothing profound here. It's not negative uh, feedback loops, which are so fashionable these days on um, genetic regulation networks. It's just introducing certain delay. Okay. But again, the uh, important message here is that um, you introduce additional reactions and you suppress noise. So what are the lessons in all this uh, for, I would say, modeling uh, papers. Uh, there's a very interesting lesson. You saw that when you start with simple and most obvious uh, system of reactions, it doesn't work. Then you can do something, for example, uh, remove the inhibition of anaphase fast. But then you cannot do something else, like maintain the tight inhibition over the whole cell. Okay? So uh, the cell has to do this co conflicting tasks each additional task to achieve it, you have to introduce one more reactions. So with this big interactome, a uh, big system of reactions, none of them is wasted. Each, of, each one of them is needed to achieve these conflicting goals. Okay. It's not yet explicitly clear how, how it's done, but that's the window of opportunity for theoretical physicists to actually see how this multi-objective optimization works. I'm, I'm a little bit confused as to how, how the approach by non uh is different from the approach by Ibrahim. And that they've incorporated, in Ibrahim's paper, they've incorporated all of the reactions. Right. And in Bartai's paper, they're taking apart reaction by reaction to identify what each protein in the interconnect one does. So, is that, is that what I'm well, Maybe. So in uh, Ibrahim et al, it's easy to describe it. They take all the reactions, no, but remember my criticism, they take uh, the reactions which are convenient for them. They ignore some of the work, they take the reactions from different uh, papers describing different organisms. Importantly, they don't talk about spatial coordination at all, they just reactions in time. Uh, and in, in a way it's realistic because they talk about actual molecules and actual rates of reaction. Now what Barkay do, does, um, they don't talk about actual reactions at all. They just name a couple of important proteins. They name CDC, they name BAP, and they ignore most of the proteins completely. And all these uh, reactions are just basically, basically a fantasy that they are thinking about. So it's uh, what is called these days conceptual model. It can be used to model actual experiments, but it proves certain concepts, which is very useful. So, and importantly, they uh, look at what's happening uh, not only in time, but also in space. Okay, and that drew uh, attention of biologists to this aspect. Many, many of them were thinking about it for a while, but biologists are sort of, they uh, don't like talking about something without hard data. And there's no hard data about spatial distribution on this problem. Nothing is known about it. That's sort of the, the dream of biologists to figure it out. 
So, uh, and let me, uh, in the end of this, this part of the story, mention a little bit uh, something about uh, the, about what, what is actually uh, the, the input into all this system of biochemical reaction. What is the signal from the kinetic core? Remember that kinetic core has to activate MAD2, uh, or yeah, activate MAD2 to suppress ATC. And the answer is nobody knows. But this is where mechanical chemistry is. Uh, so what I mean is the following. See, the original uh, idea, which was so uh, elegantly depicted into, in uh, one of the first slides, this one, so uh, basically says very simple thing. Uh, MAD2 gets onto the kinetic core and gets activated. When microtubule attaches to this kinetic core, well, there's simply physically no space for MAD2 to get on, to get activated, right? That, and reactions like that are uh, ubiquitous in, uh, in biology. Uh, well, not so simple, because uh, some experiments uh, show that if, uh, if um, the both kinetic cores have microtubules attached, but attached improperly. This is the so-called synthetic attachment. Uh, kinetic cores and sister chromatids are uh, attached to the same pole, right? So it's bad. But the cell doesn't care about it because uh, this kind of attachment doesn't send uh, the signal to go into anaphase. Okay? So uh, then there were some elegant experiments showing that why this doesn't work because not only attachment is important, but the tension is important. So if kinetic cores attach properly from different poles, then this, this pole pulls this sister chromatid this way, this pole that way. And so when there's tension, the force here, then this force uh, sends uh, the, the signal to go into anaphase. So that's why it's a mechanochemical reaction, not just simple biochemical reaction. But the nature of this reaction, nobody knows. Yeah. So, does that force cause structural changes in the uh, activation side? In the, or so, what, what is clear, it uh, makes structural changes in the kinetic core. But kinetic core is uh, even more complicated than the regosome. It's such an, it's just a zoo of uh, molecules arranged in a very special uh, spatial temporal order. So, what exactly is happening there, nobody knows. But this is one of the biggest prizes out there. That's, uh, that would be not Nobel Prize, but close. Uh, it went somebody figures it out. OK, so that was um, the story about, um, uh, about uh, the mitotic spindle checkpoint. Before I go into the next beautiful story, I'll ask questions, because we'll shoot here after that and go into mechanics without any biochemistry. No questions? OK. Done. Let me go uh, into the next one. Okay. All right. So let me tell you another story, and the story about uh, oscillations. And theoretical physicists love oscillations simply because they're beautiful and because the models of oscillations are so elegant. Uh, and the, there are some examples of really beautiful oscillations in this spindle. So uh, let me tell you about a uh, first biologically important process. Uh, so uh, this is uh, C. elegans, cell in C. elegans. So C. elegans is this worm, uh, which actually the, the worm itself is uh, really fancy. Uh, let, let me sort of to, uh, to relax the atmosphere, to uh, sort of let, give you an opportunity to relax, tell you an uh, interesting story. I was working on um, modeling the uh, uh, system of system controlling defecation in uh, C. elegans world. So uh, the fancy biological clock control, controls how often the worm takes, takes a shit. Uh, so it happens uh, normally every uh, 40 seconds, like, like a clock. 40 seconds it goes, 40 seconds it goes. Um, so of, of course uh, it's not macabre uh, curiosity. Uh, the, the price is the clock. Nobody cares about actual defecation. 
Uh, and the, the clock is this very, very beautiful uh, biochemical oscillator. Uh, and um, when I was collaborating with experimental biologists on that, uh, they discovered uh, that it's also mechanochemical. And here's the mechanical part. You take a tiny needle and you sort of poke uh, the, uh, the worm on, an, uh, on the nose, let's say. And it gets scared and sort of too scared to take a shit. And uh, the interesting thing is that if you, if you do it kind of randomly, then it's getting blood, of it, but at some time it just unloads. Uh, <laughs> but if you, if you synchronize poking, if you poke at certain point in, in the cycle of this biochemical oscillator, then uh, it's constipated at, right at the moment when it wants to go. And then it just explodes. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, so then this form, same elegance, is actually seriously speaking. Uh, same as trazocola, uh, same as yeast, it's extremely important organism in biology because it, uh, its genetics is completely understood. And lots and lots of mutants are available, they're characterized. Uh, it's very easy to do experiments with them. So this is one of this uh, organism, this is um, animal which is sacrificing millions of lives to, to make uh, ultimately our lives better. So, what I wanted uh, seriously to talk about is this. Um, the important uh, weird thing about uh, mitosis in uh, and cell division in serigans that its cells uh, have to divide asymmetrically, unlike uh, a lot of other animal cells. So uh, when sort of in telophase, remember the last part of anaphase, telophase, when chromosomes are segregated, surround by daughter nuclei, then uh, the cell divides. So uh, one of the functions of this mitotic spindle, which I didn't uh, talk about yet, is uh, uh, molecular motors are moving uh, by, uh, uh, molecules, proteins, which uh, tell the cell where to assemble so-called contractile ring, the bunch of actin and myosin molecules which contract like that and uh, divide the cell in two. Okay. So uh, in C. elegans, this um, this should happen so that there will be one small daughter, this is kind of in disadvantage, and one big daughter in advantage. And uh, if there's error like that, there's again cancer, death, and so on. And so uh, clearly, to do that, the very important thing is position the spindle properly. And uh, for a while, it was a big, uh, big mystery. How does the spindle know to end up with this pole, which is called posterior pole? close to this uh, posterior end of the cell. And this pole, which is anterior pole, far from uh, the end. So I'll tell you how this uh, problem was solved. And uh, on the way, uh, these useless but very beautiful oscillations were discovered. So um, here's, uh, the, there was a really brilliant paper by Stefan Grill, who is now in uh, Dresden, uh, and authors in science uh, a few years ago, uh, which I also uh, really encourage any of you to, uh, to read. Uh, so it was already suspected, of course, that the way to position the spindle asymmetrically is to uh, pull uh, on the uh, microtubules. So, to, so microtubules coming from uh, opposite poles, they reach the surface of the cell, the cortex, and the idea that molecular motors, uh, like dynein, it, it was actually proved that it's dynein, are sitting on the cortex and trying to pull on microtubules to reel them in into the boundary of the cell. And so the idea is that from, from the posterior, uh, like from this pole, you pull really hard. And from the anterior, you pull, you pull weak. Uh, and then mechanical balance would be that you uh, displace your spindle closer to this end from, you, from which you are pulling hard. So uh, one of the biggest um, active areas these days is to understand how to create <coughs> this asymmetry in pulling. And I can't even go into the story because it will require a few hours. It's a very beautiful um, biochemical control mechanism <coughs> involving uh, part proteins. So those proteins uh, assemble at this part and they recruit more molecular motors and so on. It's actually I know that at least one of you is modeling this mean uh, system and bacteria. Those PAR uh, proteins are very similar. It's a very similar reaction diffusion system. So, 
uh, the topic of this work was the following. Uh, they were asking how many actually uh, dining motors pulling uh, micro pebbles and which, which force they, they create. Okay. So um, from Dr. Ha's uh, talk, uh, you know that you can measure actual forces of single molecules, but it's much easier in vitro than in vivo. In vivo, it's really hard. So nobody yet succeeded in actual, actually measuring uh, forces in life spindle. There are some uh, very crude work uh, done by Bruce Nicholas when he sort of managed to insert tiny glass needle in the cell and pull and stuff. And the needle bends and you can estimate the forces. But those are incredibly crude estimates. So in this system, nobody did it. However, they did a very clever thing. And this is the example when you uh, combine a uh, theoretical model with experimental facts to find out how many motors are uh, pulled. It's very beautiful. And here's the idea. They blasted the center zone with a laser. Okay. And after this blast, center zone breaks in little pieces. And so then, say, uh, the whole chromos, uh, center zone is pulled in many different directions by the ion motors. So it stays where it is. You blast it, and then every little piece attached to just one microtubule. And then this microtubule pulls it to the, uh, cort uh, to the cortex. So after the blast, all these little pieces start uh, moving in the right direction. Okay. And this is the uh, experimental data for sort of after hundreds of experiments, what are the average velocity of movement in uh, any direction. So what do we get from this? Here's the beautiful thing. Uh, imagine that uh, you have N uh, working motors, motors working on pull by pulling each uh, of the fragments. And let's say, uh, so VE is the uh, velocity uh, with which one motor pulls. And this VE is basically the force of the motor divided by some friction coefficient. Now, what is very important is this idea that the motor can be uh, working with probability P and not working with probability 1 minus P. So the motors, of course, as you remember from the beginning, they can be either attached and working or detached. So all the motors are not 100% processive, so they work for a while, detach, work for a while, detach. So that's on, off, on, off. Probability that it's on is P. Now, uh, try to recall uh, some elementary probability you no doubt uh, learned either in high school or at the university. Let's say you're flipping the coin, right? And uh, let's say the coin is not honest, so uh, probability to have head is greater than probability to have tail. So uh, let's say probability to have head is P, right? And you do 100 trials. How many heads do you expect? 100 times P, right? Now, what is the variance in this uh, experiment? Well, the variance is 100 times P times 1 minus P. Okay? That's the famous thing from probability theory. And now, say if P is equal to 0, you have no variance. You know you always get tails. P is equal to 1, there's no variance. You always get heads. But if you have P equal to 0.5, uh, honest coin, then you have the biggest probability of all. So when you measure velocity, you measure some average velocity, which is proportional to P. And you measure variance. Uh, variance of your measurement will be proportional to P times 1 minus P. And then you do the algebra. And uh, you find a uh, really uh, excellent formula that variance is the quadratic function of average velocity. There's, uh, it's proportional to linear velocity minus something uh, average velocity squared. And the coefficient in front of average velocity squared is 1 over n, where n is the number of motors. Okay. And so average velocity is easy to measure. Variance, of course, uh, result of your measurement, and you don't have to do any molecular measurement. You just do the measurement, fit the parabola to that, right? And from this coefficient, find the number of motors pulling. Turned out to be 20 to 30 motors. Okay, so th this this is uh, this great idea how you combine very easy theory with uh, an interesting experiment uh, to get this idea how many motors are pulling. So now uh, let me get into the actual oscillations. This is uh, the data. 
So there were there were a number of papers, all of them are referenced here, uh, which uh, figured it out. So here's the phenomenon. When the spindle moves uh, in the posterior direction, uh, the posterior poles start to oscillate like that. Uh, spectrum, spectrum analysis was done and it was found that it's almost uh, perfect sinusoidal oscillations. So the question is where these oscillations are coming from. So let me tell you right, right away that biologically the significance of this is probably zero. The idea is that these biological oscillations are just artifacts of uh, balance of forces in the spindle. The cell doesn't need them. Okay. Uh, but uh, of course from the point of view of physicists it's very interesting to understand where they're coming from. And here's the... How do you know this other than it? Pardon? How do you know this other Well, we, we don't. We don't. But uh, here's one hint. Uh, there, there's uh, one of the mutants uh, that everything is normal in this mutant. There's, there's no oscillation, but everything else is normal. So that's a weak hint. So uh, here's the... Uh, let me tell you about two models. Uh, and the lesson from these two models. I'll, um, I'll explain with hand waving arguments how it works, uh, and I won't go deep into the equations because I, I see that many people are getting sleepy. Uh, but uh, if you're interested, you can read these papers. And from the point of view of theoretical physics, this is really beautiful stuff. And, um, I'll just hint at it. So here's the, uh, right, the, the lesson here. Let me give you a preview of what the lesson is. It's really great when uh, you have conflicting, competing models for the same phenomenon. Because then uh, people start <coughs> working hard. <coughs> then biologists are really encouraged to test. Uh, and then the truth uh, is achieved much, much faster. It's really a bad situation when you have just one model. It's nothing else. So this is one of these cases. The first model, which is uh, expressed in those two papers, so especially like physicists, uh, it's very easy to read this paper in, in physical letters, which uh, from my point of view is one of the worst journals around, but it's a mecca of theoretical physics. Um, so um, um, here's, here's the idea. Why all this prejudice for physicists? Pardon me? Why so much prejudice for ah, physicists? That's a separate story. <laughs> I'm a physicist myself. So uh, here's the idea. You have this pole, and it's pure yeah. physicists who are acting like a born again biologist. Right. <laughs> so the, this pole is pulled from uh, from the upper cortex and from the lower cortex. Okay. And uh, what's happening? So there's uh, uh, motors sitting on the upper cortex, dynamic motors, trying to pull in these microtubules. Okay. And motors trying to pull on the lower microtubules. So uh, remember I told you that motors can be on and off. So uh, on rate doesn't depend on the force, but off rate does depend on the force. If you pull on the motor, you of course rip it off faster. So off rate increases when the force is getting larger. So let's think about what happened. Let's imagine that this pole starts moving this way, right? And this motor is trying actually to pull the, speed of the, the pole this way. So the motor experiences very, very little force. It tries to walk this direction, and it's actually assisted. So the, the microtubule moving this way, right? So this motor is not going to get off. There is no force here. But this motor, this <coughs> microtubule going away from it, right? it's desperately trying to move this way, but this microtubule going away, so it will be ripped off by force. So you move this way, all these motors are happily attached and pulling. All these motors are ripped off and not pulling. So here you are. You, you don't have any choice, but you continue moving this way as positive feedback. The faster you move, the better you pull from this way and worse you pull from that way. But then, of course, when, I, when you get too close to the cortex, uh, some microtubules are just simply bumping into the cortex and stopping you. It's like a spring, effective spring. Uh, and then at some point you stop. And then, uh, when you stop, the spring uh, pushes you back. And as soon as you start moving the opposite way, those motors start attaching happily, and those motors start detaching, and then you get this oscillation. Okay. 
And the, the mathematics is called Hopf bifurcation. Mathematics. Uh, so mathematics is in this uh, slide, and it's uh, pretty self-explanatory uh, if, if you have time. So if you, if you have time, just think about the following. Uh, this is the equation for uh, for the uh, center zone. Uh, y is its coordinate, so this is its velocity. So friction coefficient times velocity equal to spring force, which is restoring it to the center, plus force from the top minus force from the bottom. And uh, those forces are proportional to probabilities of motors upstairs and downstairs to attach, and they attach with rate k on, detach with rate k off, k on is constant, k off is proportional to force, as simple as that. Then you find uh, equilibrium, do the linear stability analysis around equilibrium and find hope by rotation. So this, this is one of these things which is really beautiful to uh, explain to graduate students in the class. It works, it works very nicely. So uh, I mentioned that the thing is that um, it's good to have two competing models. So uh, just one year after this uh, model was created and the uh, authors uh, were enjoying their success, suddenly uh, another group by uh, Francois Nedelec uh, published another paper, which uh, was uh, very good news for authors of the first model, because the second model had much more actual experimental uh, data than the first, the first model. The first model was largely a fantasy, very beautiful one, but still a fantasy. The second one is much more grounded in reality. So uh, the second model uh, discovered uh, the following interesting facts. So uh, it did a uh, really beautiful and very careful fluorescent microscopy that showed that microtubules actually contact uh, the cortex uh, for only a brief period of time. So remember the story we started with, with dynamic instability. So the microtubules grow, bump into something, and then uh, start cat catastrophe. So, they uh, only touch the cortex for a very short time. More importantly, uh, these guys discovered that um, many more microtubules were con contacting uh, cortex to which uh, the center zone was moving, and much fewer were co contacting the cortex uh, from which uh, the center was moving. And so they uh, created, uh, they came up with the following hypothesis, which they actually so supported with additional data. And the hypothesis is very simple. This is actually a snapshot from their simulation. So remember I told you in the first lecture, this group uh, works very differently from the rest of us. Uh, most of us rely on equations. This group is very contemptuous of equations. What they do, they simulate every microtubule, every motor, right? which is very convincing for biologists. So see, that this is simulations. This is not experiment. But it looks stunningly like experiment. And biologists love it, especially I just didn't uh, want to uh, bring these big files with movies for me. When you look at the movie, it's an impression that you look at actual cell. And biologists just eat it up. Uh, the disadvantage of this method, sometimes there's not much insight from this model, right? When the model is very complicated, well, you know what, what you build to the model, but why this result? How the result connected to assumptions? Who knows? Too complicated. So there's always a trade-off. So the really brilliant stuff is when you can combine both. It's a simple equations model and simulation like that. But that's really rare. So uh, here's the here's what the actual model of these guys. Here's the idea. So uh, imagine that microtubules grow at uh, 0.5 micron per second, and you move uh, with the rate 0.4 micron per second this way. Then clearly. Uh, the rate of a uh, with which this this pole of this mic uh, plus end of this microtubule approaching this cortex will be 0 0.9, 0 0.4 plus 0 0.5, and the rate with which this plus end approaching this cortex will be 0 0.5 minus 0 0.4, 0 0.1, and of course uh, th this uh, this plus end will take much greater time getting to the to the target. So. Uh, and meanwhile, it can start catastrophe and never get there. So if you approach something, you contact this uh, target very often. And then the motors, over this short period of time, when you're in touch, pull. So if you move to one way, one side, 
many microfibrils bump into it, motors pull on them, right? And from this side, nothing is pulling, so you're just crashing into this thing. Uh, at the same time, they observed that microfibrils, which are lateral to this motion, they, they work like springs. So some of them get to the cortex, and then when, uh, so, so imagine that this is elastic rod, this is oscillation, so this sort of elastic spring is like a spring trying to stay here. Right, so you have spring plus this positive feedback, you have this oscillation. That's the idea. And it's competing with the first model, and nobody knows yet what, what the answer is, but biologists are very interested. Let me skip this, it just illustrates how you can get from get to the same point from equations. So it's very, so uh, remember I told you the first model gives you hope for bifurcation. From a mathematical point of view, this second model is about hysteresis, uh, relaxation oscillator. It's not hope for bifurcation. So it's a uh, very important difference uh, between them. So let me uh, end this lecture. I think, right? right. Let me end this lecture with uh, last uh, example of bifurcation, which is also very beautiful. So uh, remember in metaphrase, I'll, I'll, I told you that uh, the chromosomes are aligned at the equator of the spindle between the two poles. Well, in fact, in many cells, uh, they're not just statically aligned. They fluctuate around the equator. Okay. Uh, and this is another example when most biologists think that those are useless oscillations. Those are just sort of artifacts of balance of forces. Uh, but of course, there's no, no guarantee that those are useless. Maybe they're good for something. Uh, and so this, um, this is called directional instability phenomenon. And uh, there, there's only one, well, actually, kind of two models. So the original models of directional oscillations and the additional model actually from our group, but I can tell you that our paper is not, good, not really good. But so this original model is really good. Uh, so this original model, again, the idea of it is very simple, and uh, here's the idea that microtubules reaching uh, for the kinetic core, they interact with uh, certain motors. Uh, let's not even get into the details of what these motors are. In this original paper, some fictitious motors were uh, suggested. So what our paper did was suggesting that there are some real motors and how these real motors can play the role of this fictitious but basically what these motors do, they pull on microtubule. They try to reel the microtubule into the kinetic core. And then uh, the idea is very similar to the first model we discussed. If you have uh, two sister chromatids moving this way, what's more, actually it's a combination of the first and second model for C elegance oscillations. Lots, of, lots more microtubules will reach the kinetic core from this pole, interacting with the pulling motors, so uh, there's greater force from here. And those motors are moving away from this pole. So fewer and fewer... So the need that will is fully mechanical? Yeah. The idea is that it's fully mechanical. No weapons do it. Uh, fewer and fewer microtubules reach from here, so there's positive feedback and you uh, catastrophically move this way until you get too close to the pole and a lot of microtubules kind of like a wind push on the chromosome arms you can, you can see actually it's in, in, in micro, microscopy that chromosome get deformed like that when it gets close to this. Uh, and eventually it stops and then a lot of microtubules from here get to the uh, kinetic core and start pulling in this way until it crashes into this pole and so it ta -ta 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 -ta. So interesting nature of those oscillations, they are not periodical at all. So uh, the experimental result in this model uh, kind of um, resurrected that it's sort of chaotic oscillations like that. Okay, so that was this model. Uh, our model basically is saying that instead of this fictitious motor, we can achieve uh, the same thing from two actual motors which are known in the uh, chromosome. Um, and uh, this is the end of uh, this first lecture. The, the second one will be shorter, but at this time, uh, do you have any questions? Either I work it to the or to the <laughs> That's fine. We'll just we can have a great we don't have the last Okay. Well that's another big one.
about 300 meters from where the hotel is, going towards the end of it, the last kiosk on the next beach. So we'll be there after five, right? So basically, so when you're done here, have half an hour or 40 minutes to go change, whatever, and get in there. And uh, so we'll be there after that. Okay, any other thing on the visa? We are going to bring a, a net and a ball, which somebody wants to play with. Hello again. Uh, I'll try to be very short. Uh, so I wanted to finish with uh, uh, a story about our recent work, which I am uh, really proud of. I think this is uh, the best thing I've done in probably in my whole life. Um, I'm not sure what kind of impact it will be on uh, on my physics, but let, let me tell you why, why I'm so proud. So uh, those are uh, the people uh, who did it with me. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't uh, bring any of my students or colleagues here. Basically, they, they are too busy doing different things and going to different conferences. Though they all are fun-loving people, especially this guy, uh, he almost single-handedly single did the project. When I say we, he did it. I, I sort of was just yakking with him and uh, helping to write the paper. So Roy Wolman. Just remember this name because he will, he will be huge. He is now going to uh, Stanford uh, for a postdoc. And uh, I think I, I never saw a person so brilliant in my life. So he, uh, this photo, you see he is eating this cookie which shows uh, my uh, And so John Scull is uh, my collaborator. We, we shared um, experimental lab with him for the last uh, five years. and. Um, I'll mention some data, experimental data, which went to, to, into this project. And of course, I, uh, I'm sort of too inept to do experiments myself, but uh, people like him did all these experiments. And, uh, so Gil Sibirikogu is uh, another postdoc who helped a lot uh, with this project. Um, it's actually uh, interesting also to let you relax a little. The interesting story of how this joint lab got started. So we were doing some different work with Gil. We were uh, we have a long history of our uh, graduate students together in Canada many, many years ago. And then she was visiting me in Davis and she fell in love with John and uh, they decided to get married. Uh, and, uh, so they asked me, like, can we get married? I told them, well, sure, if, if, we, if I can benefit somehow from it. I want an access to your data, I want an access to your microscope. So that's how this project started. Um, so uh, here's um, what this uh, is about. It's basically again about the, about the spindle, uh, but the spindle in actually um, specific organism, Drosophila, which is the organism John is working uh, with his whole life. Uh, and I'm not going through this process of my test. It's basically uh, the same as uh, I described in the first lecture. There are some very interesting uh, twists in uh, Drosophila, but I just don't have time to go into those twists. Um, so, let me uh, tell you what, what is the big problem. So we want um, to understand how, uh, how elongation of spindle uh, works. How, how does the size of the spindle maintain? You could, uh, could probably understand from the first lecture that uh, the spindle length increases in stages. Right? So first it's assembled, then it's in steady state in metaphase, then it increases in um, uh, anaphase. So all these uh, lengths are uh, tightly maintained. So especially those three parameters. First, S, which is the distance between the pole. That's the spindle length. Then uh, the distance between sister chromatids, D, and the um, length of overlap between um, so-called interpolar uh, microtubules, which overlap at the equator. You'll see uh, soon why this is so important. So all these three parameters are changing as function of time. Um, so let me um, explain to you why this model is so incredibly difficult. First of all, you're dealing with four different classes of microtubules in the spindle. The first uh, class is astral microtubules. Uh, you, uh, I just told uh, you about them, those microtubules controlling the oscillations in warp spindle. Right? So those are reaching uh, the uh, boundaries of the cell and dining motors are pulling on these microtubules, trying to pull the pole into the, into the boundary, trying to elongate the spindle. Then uh, we have a second class, chromosomal microtubules. So those are sort of the most complicated ones. Those are connecting uh, the spindle poles 
with, sorry, uh, those are not the most complicated ones. Those are connecting the spindle poles with chromosome arms. Okay. And they are either pushing on arms or uh, they interact with uh, motors, which are called, cr called chromokinesins. Those are trying to walk to plus sense and kind of push microtubule away. So every time microtubule reaches the chromosome, it tries to get rid of this one, even with the help of this motor. Uh, then interpolar microtubules, which I just mentioned, those are uh, connecting, uh, overlapping at the, at the equator. You'll see in a second why. And finally, the uh, most complicated ones, kinetopolar microtubules. Again, I talked about them too. Those are connecting poles to the kinetic cores, and the problem is that there are at least eight known motors on the kinetic cores interacting with this uh, microtubules. And so see, when you want to model all this stuff, you deal with four different classes of microtubules, and you deal with uh, more than 10 uh, molecular motors and other uh, important proteins, which are absolutely essential. So uh, you mutate, you get rid of one of these motors, so you inhibit one of them something goes terribly wrong. So to understand uh, this people, you have to uh, maintain all of them, right? So you, you see that we have too many, too many stuff uh, to model. So before we actually even get into, uh, into this modeling, let me tell you what are we going to model. So uh, the hypothesis, which is, mind you, only one of the hypotheses, there are some competing hypotheses that, uh, that are saying that the spindle maintains its size without any mechanics, without any forces. That it's all controlled by uh, spatial, temporal, by chemical clouds of different proteins. Okay. And uh, there's no conclusive um, argument yet against this competing hypothesis. However, together with John, uh, I, uh, well, I can't say believe, I hope that our view is right, uh, that it's, it's uh, ultimately balance of forces produces, produced by microtubules and all these motors that maintain the geometry and dynamics of the spin okay. We could be proved wrong, we'll see. So uh, what, what we want to do is to, uh, to, uh, to balance all the, uh, all the forces uh, in the spindle and see how this force balance uh, maintains the spindle geometry. So uh, let me tell you what is absolute, the absolutely vital uh, biological data for, for this project. So uh, what, what you see here is a classical measurement which was uh, done uh, about 10 years ago, which is uh, simply distance between the spindle poles as, as a function of time. So here, the uh, nuclear angle breaks down. After that, there's a, a separation of uh, central zones of spindle poles while uh, search and capture takes place. So you'll remember search and capture from the first lecture. And then uh, kind of almost steady state of the metaphase. And then explosion-like elongation and anaphase in the end of my process. So, uh, and that's very important uh, to go precisely through this, uh, sep uh, through this segregation of the poles. Because meanwhile, as you saw, cell has to perform many different things. You maintain wrong distance at certain stage. Everything is screwed up. So uh, the beautiful thing is that in Drosophila all the genetics is known and also lots of drugs are developed to inhibit this or that motor. And uh, so John in his lab over about eight years of work assembled eight uh, different uh, mutants or by chemically inhibited spindles. So each uh, of these uh, curves, for example this one, right, represents uh, the data for uh, either knockout or inhibition of certain motors, or it actually even couples of motors. So you uh, basically, if it, it's something like that. We want to understand how a car works, and we don't have a blueprint. So what do we do? We pull out a uh, certain, uh, certain little detail, and uh, the car starts to work badly. Right? We record what, uh, what this defect is, and we know what we broke. And then we break something else, and the idea that when we break too many things and record, the number of list of things that go wrong, we can understand how health of matter works, that sort of thing. But how? how? How exactly do you use this data to understand the balance of forces? And that's what I uh, wanted to explain. So this is sort of the uh, overview of, of this thing. So we have the mechanics. Right? And uh, important thing to understand that we have speeches. So it is experimental fact 
that molecular motors switch on at some point and switch off at some other point that we don't know exactly when. It, at, at this point, uh, experimental biology is not good enough to, to let us measure when, because on and off means some protein is getting phosphorylated and we don't even know which protein. Right? So we don't know when motors are on and off. So we have this mechanics and we have the phenotype. We have the geometry of this time dependent geometry of the spindle. So this is known. Right? This, uh, we kind of know the global picture, but we don't know the coefficients, parameters, we don't know the details. And uh, important thing to realize that behind this mechanics, there's this tremendous interactomal biochemical regulation. And this is, in fact, what biologists are more interested in. This is the um, system of biochemical reaction which phosphorylate and dephosphorylate the motors. Okay. And uh, we, we know the parts, we know the reactions, but we know nothing about concentrations, spatial distribution of coefficients. And so we, we don't do anything about it yet. But that's uh, the, the big uh, goal of uh, future work and future in long, long term future, like 10 years or 20 years. So let me uh, very briefly tell you what, uh, what the model is. Next few slides will be very scary, but uh, don't worry about actually remembering anything. So we describe every motor by uh, four parameters. The maximal force it can produce when it moves. The free velocity with which it moves without producing any force. And we assume that every motor is characterized by a linear force velocity curve. Uh, remember force velocity curve we discussed. So this is one of the big limitations of the model. Because many motors have nonlinear uh, force velocity curves. The problem is that if we allow nonlinearity to write equations, there's no problem. But to solve them becomes a total nightmare. Um, so, uh, and plus two other uh, parameters. The motor is switched off at some time and switched on at another time. And that's another limitation of the model. There are hints that some motor may be switched on and off a few times during my process. We just can't handle this yet. So we allow for motor to, uh, to switch on and or off right, only once. Uh, and then uh, the idea is uh, kind of simple. So let me uh, tell you what, uh, what the idea is. So uh, let's, let's consider one chrom uh, um, chromosome microtubule connecting the pole uh, with the um, with the chromosome and this chromokinesian motor trying, trying to push the microtubule away. So uh, the idea actually is um, very simple. The idea is to write force balance equation of this microtubule. Uh, in the cell, you can ignore all the inertial forces, obviously, it's uh, very low Reynolds numbers. And you can ignore even viscous forces, because viscous forces, in fact, are uh, of the order of like 0 0.01 piconewton, while each motor, if you remember, generates about piconewton size force. So you simply balance uh, the forces. So in this, in this case, uh, in, in the simple case, uh, when there's just one motor uh, pushing the microtubule, uh, well, you um, just uh, use the force velocity relation to make sure that the total force on microtubule is zero. Otherwise, it will be propelled through, through the full cell. And, and there are more complicated uh, possibility. This motor trying to push microtubule away but there's also another motor at the pole. It's actually a known motor called clip 10 a which uh, actually, it's like a pencil sharpener. It's really microtubule in uh, chopping it off at the end. So then you have a balance of two motors, right? And you have to balance two forces, the polymerizing uh, motor force and chromokinesin motor force. And this is another limitation of the model because we don't actually know that it works as simple as that. that you know, uh, one motor pushes and another feels exactly this force and sort of balances this force. That's, that's an assumption. And after that, it's basically bookkeeping. You have to keep track of all microtubules, all possible scenario, all forces, and just get it together. Okay. So it's a kind of a pain to write it down correctly and to code uh, this correctly, but uh, it's nothing more than keeping track of which, which motors are active and balancing all forces to zero. And then here's sort of the level of complexity we're dealing with. We have to look at four different classes of microtubule. In each classes of microtubule, there are different arrangements with all possible motors known in Brazil. So when you're using the score balance, how do you, like, I may have missed it when you're how do you account for the growth of microtubules? 
So we allow micro pebbles to either grow and shrink or with a certain velocity. And then uh, we just include it into, into the equation because the force depending on the velocity. Yeah. So we, we solve the equation to find the equation for force velocity. Oh, it will be, so uh, after we get it all together, let me tell you what mathematics is actually conceptually very simple. Uh, we have this huge number of algebraic equations for force velocity relations. Then we have equation for uh, separation of the poles. It's basically a rate of separation of the poles is the total sum of all forces from all four classes of microtubules such as the poles divided by characteristic viscous friction coefficient which, which is measured. Uh, same thing with uh, sister chromatids. Rate of movement is total sum of all forces acting on chromosomes divided by effective uh, friction. Of course, it only works when, when they're segregated. Uh, and then we have equation for so all... So friction value by experimental numbers? Or? Uh, those are... Well, I'll get to it. We know experimentally the orders of magnitude. Um, and uh, then we have overlap. So why, why do we need actually this overlap? Well, for simple reason. Remember, I discussed those motors, which are like that, which are trying to push this microtubule apart, so slide them apart. So the, uh, experimentally, it's known that these motors sit on every available place in the overlap. So the total force is proportional to the total number of motors, which is also an assumption. Uh, and this total number is proportional to the length of the overlap. That's why you should keep track of this. So uh, the numerical procedure looks like kind of simple. We uh, solve all these algebraic equations uh, for single microtubules, finding the relation between individual forces and velocity of sing velocities of single microtubules. Then we uh, integrate, basically, summating all the populations of motors and microtubules. Uh, and then we uh, integrate for one type step we solve it using forward error method. We uh, find, knowing all forces, we find velocities, we find how geometry uh, changes, and that's how it goes. Right, so numerically, it's